Three words. Three simple words that ended up defining a generation. Oh, the humanity. Those three simple words uttered during a catastrophe witnessed by a man raised in Scottsdale, Pennsylvania. On that wet, cold day in New Jersey, Herbert Morrison witnessed history and then became part of the story himself. 85 years later, we honor our local hero. Born in Connellsville, Pennsylvania on May 14, 1905 to Walter Lindsay and Bertha Ogilvie Morrison, little Herbert grew up in Scottsdale. His father, Walter, left the family when Herb was a toddler, and Bertha moved back in with her mother who owned a boarding house in Scottsdale. The house that Herbert grew up in still stands today at 316 Market Street. Even early on, newspaper articles demonstrated Herb's interest in music. Rehearsals are going forward steadily for a play at the Geyers Opera House under the direction of Miss Elizabeth McClaskey. This production takes the place of the annual minstrel show. There will be about 200 local people in the cast, and the program is as follows. Tot's reception, Herbert Morrison, Eddie Bell, Roger Browning, Claire Hiskell, John Blower, Percy Jarrett, J. Warren Brooks. By 1920, Herb's mother was supplementing the family's income by working at a local jewelry store. Herb was 15 and in high school. My first radio experience came in 1920 when I played banjo with my high school band. We played live on the radio. Herb graduated from Scottsdale High School in 1923. Soon life would offer him an opportunity he couldn't refuse. Herbert Ogilvie Morrison, 316 Market Street, Scottsdale, has been nominated by a representative Clyde Kelly for admission to West Point, subject to the entrance examination to be held in March 1924. In 1924, Herb had his second taste of the radio. He played the banjo in the dance band The Clark's Pennsylvanians Band, live at WCAE in Pittsburgh. Ironically, a few years later, Herb would work for WCAE. In the fall of 1924, Herb left his home in Scottsdale when he was accepted and enrolled in the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. While he only attended for two years, he was part of another history-making moment. West Point agreed that year to allow a motion picture film crew on campus. In the movie, which no longer exists, Herb played his banjo and may have had an uncredited walk-on role. The West Point and Army atmosphere in Dick Barthelmess's picture classmates is strictly accurate. You may rely upon the West Point authorities personally as to that point. Never before had the more or less sacred confines of the U.S. Military Academy been invaded by a movie colony, and when finally the red tape was cut for Barthelmess to film, the authorities demanded this one stipulation, accuracy. Once they were assured that there would be no exaggeration of West Point's traditions, the military authorities there then threw their entire resources at the disposal of Barthelemus and his company. By 1926, Herb was back in Scottsdale. The class of 1923, Scottsdale High School, will hold its first Yuletide reunion on Wednesday evening in the form of a dance at Reed Hall from 9 until 1 a.m. On the committee are Margaret Zimmerman, Mabel Crate Reynolds, Dorothy Jane Parker, Dorothy Miller, Herbert Morrison, Wilbur Eugis, S.B. Reed, and Albert Strickler. Music wasn't Herb's only interest. He was a bit of a man of his times. In 1928, Herb took flying lessons at the La Trobe Airport and obtained his private pilot license in 1929. Perhaps because he was raised without a father figure, in the late 1920s, Herb became heavily involved in the Scottsdale Area Boy Scout program. On October 31st, a fencing club will be started at the Y under the direction of Herbert Morrison, a former member of the West Point fencing team. Herbert Morrison is proving very popular as a Boy Scout instructor. The number of boys who are interested in the camp this year will make it necessary to run a fourth period. While some believed Herb's father died, he didn't. He moved away from his family to Ohio before remarrying, living in Chicago and Milwaukee. It's unknown just how much contact Herb had with his father, but we do know he paid respect for his father at his passing. Herbert Ogilvy Morrison of Scottsdale left Connellsville Saturday night on the Capitol Limited for the home of his brother, W. Franklin Morrison of Chicago. He and his brother attended the funeral of their father, Walter L. Morrison. 
The 1930 census shows Herb living again with his mother in Scottsdale and working as a shoe salesman. His mother, Bertha, was working as a radiotrician, repairing radios. But less than a month later, Herb accepted his very first job in radio with the brand new WMMN in Fairmont, West Virginia. The radio station broadcast from the Fairmont Hotel and featured twin 90-foot-tall radio towers on the rooftop. The station manager gave me a script, sent me into the studio, and then called up his friends and had them judge how I sounded. I started in radio in 1930 on the only Friday the 13th of that year. My interest in radio dated back to World War I. In 1932, Herb was working at a radio station just across the Mexican border from Del Rio, Texas. This border blaster, extremely high-powered AM station, is legendary in the broadcasting industry. The station... XER, known as the Sunshine Station Between the Nations, was established in 1932 by Dr. John Brinkley, a nationally known doctor who had no medical degree and questionable ethics. Brinkley's Kansas stations had been shut down by the government. The Mexico station was licensed for 1 million watts, making it the most powerful radio station on the planet. It could be heard in Canada, but it was shut down by the Mexican government in 1933. By 1935, we find Herb working in Gary, Indiana, but by early 1937, Herb landed in Chicago. Connellsville folks who remember Herbert Morrison, former KQV WJAS announcer, may well be proud of him. Herb's face is the cover picture on the current issue of Stand By, a Chicago radio magazine. He is honored because of his daredevil flight over the recent southern flood zone and his description over station WLS Chicago, where he is now employed. Already ravaged by the Great Depression, the late winter of 1937 brought devastating flooding to the Ohio and Mississippi River Valleys. WLS in Chicago devoted its broadcast to serve those farmers and spearheaded an effort to raise money. Herb had made news for himself by reporting while flying over the region in a press plane provided by American Airlines. Morrison's reports were so moving that someone anonymously left a donation of $20,000. Morrison, a 31-year-old reporter for WLS Radio in Chicago, had a personal interest in aviation and was a pilot himself. He became acquainted with officials of American Airlines while covering the flooding in the Ohio and Mississippi Valleys by air in early 1937. And the airline suggested that Morrison fly to Lakehurst in one of their flagship club planes to cover the anniversary of the Hindenburg's first American landing. From the time the National Broadcast Company was founded in 1926 until May of 1937, there was a strict rule that nothing heard on the network was to be recorded. Every voice and every musical note heard on the NBC network was live. Until Herb. Morrison wanted to record the landing and broadcast it later. Morrison convinced the management at WLS to attempt to record the story. The Presto Recording Company supplied the state-of-the-art equipment to record on. The Hindenburg broadcast began as nothing more than a publicity stunt sponsored by American Airlines, which is mentioned during the broadcast prior to the explosion. The Hindenburg was built in 1936 and was the largest in the German fleet. The ship was a massive 812 feet long and 135 feet in diameter. The Hindenburg had changed the transportation industry, allowing travelers to cross the Atlantic in just two and a half days, compared with a week it took by ocean liner to cross. Only the very wealthy could afford to pay for passage on the Hindenburg. The experience was the apex of Depression-era luxury travel. It had been in service for over a year, providing 17 cross-Atlantic trips, and this docking would have kicked off the new season of travel. I'd been a pilot since 1929, so I was anxious to see the Hindenburg land that night. It was the greatest dirigible that had been built until that time, and I wanted to see it up close. Also, my engineer Charlie Nelson and I were experimenting with a tape recording system. I wanted to prove you could cover special events by making a recording on the scene to be played later on a regular news show. At that time, live radio was the thing, but our station sent us to Lakehurst with massive acetate discs and other equipment. The cases weighed about 100 pounds each. I was doing it on my days off. We set everything up in a small hangar next to the massive Hindenburg's hangar so we could get a good view of everything. 
Morrison and Nelson set up their equipment and then waited for 12 hours. The airship had been delayed due to bad weather. They recorded an opening commentary prior to the approach of the airship explaining the delays in the words, safety comes first, as it always should. Herb Morrison was so willing to cover the event that he went to Lakehurst on his day off and was never paid for his busman's holiday by WLS, even though he faced physical danger and exhaustion and nearly precipitated an international incident. Herb's great niece reported that when Herb arrived at Lakehurst, he had bumped into a photojournalist he knew, and this man had given Herb a flask of whiskey. Herb didn't drink, but took the flask and slipped it into his overcoat pocket. Herb later would use the whiskey to help some of the victims. Little did they know their position between the mooring mast and hangar put them in the perfect spot to capture history live as it unfolded. It was getting dark and a little drizzle of rain had started. The landing crew was spread out around the landing strip. We could see the Hindenburg coming in and down and down and down. About 10 minutes out, I started talking into the microphone. I was talking about what it meant to the United States to have this connection with Germany and how it showed the success of air travel. Since everyone expected it to be only a routine landing, I didn't try to give the moment any sense of drama. I merely described the preparations at the landing area. I could see passengers looking out the windows of the ship. They were waving. The ship was just standing still, and the vast motors were holding it. They had dropped lines out of the nose, and the ground crew had just taken the ropes. The time was 7.25 p.m. I'd been talking about eight minutes. There was a little ripple of flame, a forerunner of disaster. Fire was bursting from the top of the ship, just forward of the place where the upper fin met the hull, and that's when I announced it was on fire. There was this terrific burst of flames and explosion, and it spun around like a pinwheel on the back end. Here I was describing how beautiful the ship was, then, boom! It was like walking down Grant Street saying, what a lovely day it is, then all of a sudden, a building blows up in front of you. People around me gasped, they started crying and screaming. We could see things falling out of the Hindenburg. Some of those things were people. 248 members of the ground crew began to panic and run for their lives. A scoop of a lifetime had just been dropped into Herb's lap. The fire raced across the ship at a terrific speed because it was filled with hydrogen. It took about 34 seconds in all. The explosions were so loud that the needles ground down into our acetate recording discs. But Charlie kept monitoring, and I kept talking. In the recording, you hear me say, Get out of the way, please. I'm sorry, lady. An elderly woman had stepped in my way. Then she fainted. I caught her around the waist with my left hand and held on to the mic with my right. I kept on broadcasting as she dropped to the floor. That's when I told her I couldn't help her. I went right on talking, but in the back of my mind was the thought, this just can't be happening. The things I'm saying are lies, every one of them. Terror was everywhere. It was terrible. The stress was terrible. As Morrison wept in horror and gasped for breath, the heat from the explosion had cooked his rain-soaked wool suit. Nelson carefully brought the recorder back up to its proper level, while protecting the spinning disc from debris that now floated down from the ceiling of the hangar. In the frenzy then on the field, I began to record what was happening. I thought all of the 97 people on board had burned. It was more sight than sound. The biggest sounds after the explosion were the sirens and the clanking of our trucks. You could hear cracking things inside and you could hear the rush of air feeding the hydrogen. Altogether, it was really amazing how little sound there was. It was this horrible burning structure settling to the ground. It didn't crash, it settled. If you enjoy these little videos, please remember to like and subscribe to this channel. And don't forget to join the Scottsdale Historical Society. Membership is just $25, and each donation helps support programming. Join today online at scottsdalehistoricalsociety.com and like them on Facebook. Morrison told Nelson to stop recording because he realized there were injured people who needed help. Both men ran to assist the injured. I saw dark objects fall, and at first I thought they were pieces of cargo. Then I realized the pieces were humans. I ran out and helped pull survivors from the wreckage. 
Philip Mangon was an internationally known dress designer from New York who survived the crash but was severely burned. Somehow, in the flashing second of the explosion, I regained my presence of mind. I grabbed a chair and smashed it through the window. I gripped the window sill and looked out. We seemed a little less than 200 feet high. I, I said to myself, I can't jump. We're too high. I'll break my legs. But I couldn't wait. A moment or two later, as the wrecked ship sank downward, I jumped. The framework of the dirigible pinned me down. I lay flat in the tangle of the wreckage, but my body wasn't crushed. I worked frantically to get myself out of the wreckage. Desperately, I scraped a hole in the dirt. Somehow, I burrowed myself out like a mole. I was conscious all the time. It seemed like an age before I squirmed through. I stood up, dazed. The shock had been so great I didn't know what I was doing. All around me was the smell of burning flesh. Men were rushing about excitedly. Some were badly burned passengers, other members of the ground crew. Everything was in panic. Passengers were crying and screaming. I reeled under my own steam toward a building in the distance. As I ran up to the wreckage, I saw a man staggering toward me with his hands raised over his head. He was arguing with the sailors nearby, saying he didn't want to go to an ambulance because his daughters were on the ground. They would find him. On the ground were Mangon's two adult daughters. They had been watching the landing and were terrified their father was dead. His daughter, Catherine, thought no one could make it out alive. I began seeing people moving around the wreck, and I climbed a fence and ran onto the field looking for my father. I ran into Herb, and he grabbed me by my arm. I told him to go away and that I had to find my father. He asked my father's name, and he said he would broadcast it if my father survived so my mother would know he was safe. I shouted out his name and bolted towards the wreckage. Herb overheard the man's name and realized he had just spoken to the injured man's daughter. He offered to help reunite the family, but he also noticed just how severely burned Mangon was. I wasn't far away and was talking to another survivor and another few sailors looking for any information on Dad when the headlights of a passing car illuminated the area where my dad and Morrison were. I ran toward my father. I simply couldn't believe he had survived the inferno. I saw Catherine running to embrace her father, and I was alarmed. I knew if they embraced, the blisters could burst, opening her father up for infection. I knocked her away, then apologized profusely, explaining why I interrupted the embrace. I acted on reflex, from what I learned in about 1918 as a Boy Scout in Scottsdale, Pennsylvania. Herb escorted the father and daughter to a waiting ambulance, and then headed back to the airplane hangar. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm back again. I I raced down to the burning ship, and just as I walked up to the ship over climbed over the picket lines, I met a man coming out, dazed, dazed. He couldn't find his way. I grabbed a hold of him. It's Philip Mangon, Philip Mangon, M-A-N-G-O-N-E of New York. Philip Mangon. He's burned terribly in the hands, and he's burned terribly in the face. His eyebrows and all his hair is burned off, but he's walking and talking, plainly and distinctly, and he told me he jumped. He jumped with other passengers. Mangon was severely burned, but he did survive. He remained in the hospital for six months recovering. His family said he kept the burn suit he was wearing the night he escaped the Hindenburg for the rest of his life as a souvenir. Herb, with Mike in hand, began interviewing other survivors. I kept on talking for a total of 43 minutes during the next two hours. I interviewed people who had jumped and some who had fallen. Some did not even know how they got from the sky to the ground. Others who had been on the ship were too hysterical to talk, and some would never talk again, for they were dead or dying in the field. Everywhere there was whimpering and sobbing and screams. In all, 36 died. That's how I was able to get the only eyewitness recorded broadcast of what happened. It became famous, as you may know, not because of anything I did, but because of what I saw there and wish I could forget. I look back on it as just an assignment, an unexpectedly bad assignment. I consider myself fortunate that I could be steady enough to describe it. Naturally, I was stunned. I was telling something beautiful, and then it turned horrible. I can still see that field and hear the sounds I heard then. Ever the newsman, Herb's first thought after interviewing the survivors was to get his recordings on the air. I immediately called NBC in New York, figuring it would want a live broadcast. I couldn't get through. 
The news director had told his operator not to disturb him on any account because he was trying to find someone at Lakehurst to broadcast the disaster. But I'm standing 400 feet from it, I said, to no avail. I was the only radio man there. Herb was warned by security that the Germans might try to confiscate the recording. Herb and Charlie started cutting one more blank. Charlie bent over the machine and Herb pretended to report. Herb dropped the mic and picked up the discs. Charlie followed him, leaving the Presto turntable spinning unattended. When they arrived in Newark, a crowd was waiting for any information out of Lakehurst on survivors. The men, with help from the airline staff and police, made their way through the crowd and stopped for dinner at Child's Restaurant. The priceless discs were laid on the floor, hidden under their overcoats. American Airlines was concerned for their safety and taxied a plane to a remote corner of the Newark airport to pick up Herb, Charlie, and those precious discs. Even when we arrived in Chicago, we didn't know if we had anything recorded. When the Hindenburg exploded, it bounced our equipment so badly that the needle cut a large hole in the record. If that jewel needle had been broken, we'd have been bringing back a useless disc. The 16-inch green acetate record turned out to be undamaged. The first recorded voice ever heard over the NBC radio network was that of Herb Morrison and it was also the first coast-to-coast -coast recorded news broadcast. The Germans didn't want the recording broadcast and believed sabotage brought down their ship. But after hearing Morrison's factual report, they withdrew their objections. Even Hitler requested a personal copy. If I had not been at the airport making a recorded transcription of the Hindenburg's landing, there would have been no way of preserving my description. If we had merely broadcasted live, the description would have been lost as soon as it was given. Radio Guide gave Morrison a medal for his outstanding work. WLS awarded both men gold watches. The four original Presto Green Seal lacquer discs were then locked in the vault at the station and were delivered to the National Archives on January 22, 1938. Years later, while serving in World War II, Herb was interviewed by Takeoff magazine and said he got a terrific kick out of making radio history. Herb entered the Army Air Corps in March of 1942. He'd earned his pilot's license when he was just 23 years old, yet he never saw combat. Most likely, our government knew the Germans would make him a target. Imagine how much propaganda they could have created by shooting him down. Instead, Herb was shipped out to Oklahoma in April of 1942 to serve at Tinker Field, which one day would become Tinker Air Force Base. Now a captain in the Army Air Forces and an assistant post operations officer at Tinker Field, Morrison still recalls vividly that night in 1937. His favorite expression today is, we have all got to cooperate with each other to win this war. He applies that to his own thoughts and actions. The voice we've all heard saying, oh, the humanity, wasn't actually how Herb sounded. Charlie's recorder ran slow, causing Herb's voice to be recorded at a higher pitch. The correct version of Herb's voice is different and the shockwave from the blast was less muffled. There were some reports that Morrison was fired from WLS because of his emotional reaction during the blast. Morrison himself denied that he was terminated and the station's weekly magazine published that it was an urban legend. He did eventually land at the much larger Mutual Broadcasting Network in New York and was on the air at WOR. The meanest thing I think anybody has written about that coverage appeared earlier this month in the Evening Sun paper at Baltimore. The writer said, Morrison broke down when he was doing his remote so completely he was unable to continue. And contemporary historians have said his career was crippled by that display because Morrison was thought to have behaved in a very unprofessional manner. Men did not cry in 1937, no matter what the cause. That did make me mad at first. Here's someone passing on something he doesn't know anything about. I thought to myself, is it unprofessional to cry at any age? I feel very sorry for that man.
A special Medal of Merit has been awarded to engineer Charles Nelson and announcer Herbert Morrison of station WLS in Chicago by Radio Guide for their courageous work in the recent Hindenburg disaster. Morrison and Nelson kept their post and on to the recording was given aviation's unhappiest story, a story that will live for many years to come. For this remarkable reporting job under the most terrific strain ever endured by a broadcaster, Radio Guide has awarded these two men a special Medal of Merit so that people all over the country will know of their heroic deeds. Never one to brag, Herb never really discussed his time in the military and he never used his rank publicly. Perhaps he thought, because he wasn't in a combat zone, it made him less of a veteran. But from his military record, we know he was a good soldier who quickly went up the ranks. Advancement of Lieutenant Herbert O. Morrison, former WCAE employee to the rank of captain, has been announced by the commanding officer of the Oklahoma City, Oklahoma Air Depot, where Morrison is an assistant operations officer. The man who made the broadcast of the Hindenburg disaster was Herbert Morrison of Scottsdale, a personal friend of Mr. and Mrs. Charles Carroll, who operate the Latrobe Airport. Morrison, who is now a colonel in the U.S. Army Air Force, landed his BT-13 plane at the airport for a surprise visit. News of his arrival spread fast, and he spent most of the afternoon greeting acquaintances. After the war, Herb worked for a variety of radio stations in the Pittsburgh area. His mother, Bertha, had moved to a cottage near Cheat Lake, West Virginia. She died in September of 1947 and is buried in the Scottsdale Cemetery. Around this same time, the 43-year-old bachelor met a woman who would change his life right here in his hometown. Herb married Mary Jane Kelly on January of 1948. They moved into her mother's home at 912 Lauks. The hometown hero had returned. Herb lives in Scottsdale with his wife, Mary Jane. He is a member of the Scottsdale Borough Council and, for a time, served as its president. Herb continued working in radio, but in the 1950s he started a new career, still behind the microphone, but in front of the camera. He also took some time off to run for Congress in 1954 and in 1956. He lost both times. In 1958, Morrison became the news director of WTAE-TV in Pittsburgh. Nine years later, he helped establish a radio TV program at West Virginia University and served there until he retired. Not many people are still alive today that remember Herb or his wife, Mary, but he made an impression on one young boy named Dick Briarchak at the age of 10, took newspapers in town on Locks Avenue. One of my customers was Herb Morrison. I recall the day that I was delivering papers to his house and he was cutting grass in the, in the yard. And instead of me throwing the paper on a porch, he waved to me to bring the paper to him. So I walked into the backyard and handed the newspaper to him. And I noticed a gadget he was cutting the grass with. It was square. I think it was probably made out of plywood and it had a motor on top of it. And I noticed the cord running from it. So I asked him about it. He says, well, he says, I made that. It's an electric lawnmower. Well, of course, nobody ever heard of that. So he turned it upside down and showed me the blade and showed me how it worked. But he was such a wonderful guy. Soft-spoken, very pleasant. Everybody knew him. Herb continued to fly even after witnessing the legendary air disaster. In 1959, I sold my little plane. It had been to 39 states, Canada, and Mexico. But right after I sold it, I was chasing down a story about a small plane crash. Turns out, it was my little plane. By 1968, Herb had started slowing down. He and Mary sold their house in Scottsdale and moved to his mother's little cottage at Cheat Lake. There he continued to be interviewed from time to time and worked at West Virginia University. One network story said I quit radio right after the Hindenburg. Said I didn't have the heart to stay with it. Well. I went back to work the next day, and this past May, I ended a 46-year career in radio and television. In 1975, Herb's career took a new direction when Hollywood came calling. Herb served as the technical advisor on a blockbuster film featuring the Hindenburg disaster. His actual recording was used in the production, and Herb, at 71 years old, found himself traveling all over the country promoting the movie. He is a cheerful, kindly man who has never had a bad dream or episode of delayed stress from having witnessed a terrible disaster but it is easy to understand how such a decent and gentle person would react with such emotional honesty. He never forgot his little hometown and came back in 1977 to visit with some school children. 
He's extroverted and animated, the type of person who stops frequently along the way to a destination to exchange a few words with passers-by. And when he sits down to speak to you, he's talkative and open. Sometimes, though, as he talks, his eyes become thoughtful, and a serious expression slides over his features. His name is Herb Morrison, and if you know a little more about his background, you can guess where his thoughts might be at such moments. Perhaps he's recalling the horrified words he wept as the Hindenburg burned with the swiftness of paper and crashed to the ground. Morrison is a native of Scottsdale, and last week he visited the town where he grew up and later spent 20 years of his adult life. He recalled some of his experiences at the site of the Hindenburg crash for an audience of grade schoolers at South Moreland Intermediate Elementary School. Herb Morrison died in 1989 and is buried in the Scottsdale Cemetery. Fly high, Herb. You will never be forgotten.